evening, everyone, if we will stand. Get ready to go into prayer right now. If you have a need, will you just raise your hand? The Lord knows them, and we have a Lord that can meet all needs, and I'm thankful that he's in this place tonight. If you would, let's just go into prayer right now. Lord, we just love you, Lord. We're thankful for you. Grateful to be here tonight, Lord. Just needing something from you tonight, Lord. I'm praying that there, that every need that is in this place, Lord, that you are able to meet, Lord. Thankful for the things that you do and the ways that you move in this place. Lord, I'm just thankful to be able to be in the house of God. Lord, thankful that you are able to meet all needs. And Lord, just be with us tonight, Lord, and just have your way in Jesus' name. thankful tonight. Won't we just clap our hands unto the Lord and praise Him for the things that He has done in our life. And said, I was once a prisoner, but now I'm not. I'm thankful the Lord brought me 
out of my mess, and he was able to put me on the solid rock foundation. I'm thankful for him. I'm thankful that he died on the cross for me. He gave me a new name, and he washed me clean with his blood, and I'm thankful for that. We're going go, to go into our giving right now. We got Givelify, we got PayPal at Riverbend, Pentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, 1031 Mill Street, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We got text to give, 833-883-9311. And if you would, with faith tonight, let's just say this prayer. <clears throat> Upon the authority of your word I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family is saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in and I am blessed going out and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come and give, please.
if you believe that he can change your life, let's just give him some praise in this place tonight. Oh, I'm just so thankful to be here tonight. There's liberty in this place. There's freedom in here, and I'm thankful for it. Uh, if we'll have the little ones come forward, we're going to pray over them. If you would, just stretch your hand forward and let's just pray over them. The Lord can use them right now if His will. And we just need to cover them in prayer at all times. Let's just pray for them right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just pray over these little ones. I pray over your hand to be upon them, Lord. And I just pray that you surround them every day with your mercy and your grace, Lord. I pray that there is peace every day in their home, Lord. I pray that you just use them in a mighty way, Lord. Raise them up in the ways that you see fit. Lord, I pray the word of God is into them, Lord. And I pray that it hides in their heart, Lord. I pray that they are able to use it, Lord. And I just pray that you cover their home with peace and safety, Lord, in every way, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Y'all can go back. Go ahead, Brandon. You can go back. Brother Richard's going to come give the word to us tonight. Looking forward to that. He always does a good job. If you would, let's just clap our hands to the Lord as Brother Richard gets ready. Thank you, Brother Terrence. You all can be seated if you'd like. Get everything situated here. How many people are excited to be here on a Wednesday night? I know it's probably not the most glamorous thing to do to get out of your house. It's a little chilly. But you know what? We're going to have a good time tonight in the Word. We're going to be able to get into the Bible and actually hopefully try to help ourselves learn a little bit and, um, you know, make ourselves a little bit better, get a little bit closer to God. That's the goal, ain't it, Brother Shannon? So let's get after it. We're going to get into the Word tonight. We're going to open up with Proverbs 27 and 17. So if you want to turn to your... Turn your Bibles to that with me. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. And it says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Brother Larry, where'd you run off to? Would you pray over the remainder of the service, please? So as we're getting settled in a little bit tonight, I want us to go on a little journey, look at our past for a little while tonight and examine where we came from, and kind of look at where we are now and just see where we think we are. There's a lot that's changed over our lifetime and I know for me, you know, from the time I was little till now, I've been through a lot of things, had a lot of experiences and I've grown a lot, grown a little in some areas and... Hopefully, I'm a better person today than I was, you know, a few years ago. But when we think back, think about being a kid. One of the greatest things about being in that young age is that, to me, it seems like everyone was always asking, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be? What do you want to be? What do you want to be? And kids always have these, these big dreams. They, they want to be this famous person. They want to be this star athlete. They want to be an astronaut. They want to be... Uh, a high-ranking official in the military. They, they want to go. They want to get the bad guys. They, they want to be something great. But how many of you said when you were asked that question, I want to grow up and I want to be a great friend? Think about that for a minute. How, how many can say that, that you've ever pondered that in your life? Man, when I grow up, I, I want to be there for somebody. I want to be somebody that can be counted on. I want to be the person that whenever they're called on, that they will be there no matter what. No strings attached. When you need me, I'll be there. How many people can honestly say that I've ever said that? I don't think any of us ever have. And it's sad because there's so many things that we can be in this life. There's so many great things, so many paths that we can go down. And one of the simplest things that we can accomplish that could have the greatest impact on this world is if we said, you know what, I can be there for somebody. 
I can be that person that somebody needs. I can be that friend that somebody needs to lean on every now and again. I can be there when there's a need in someone's life. Many of us had those huge dreams. I remember when I was little, I was a huge Michael Jordan fan. And I'm sorry, y'all, but he's still the GOAT in my opinion. You can, you can call on LeBron James all you want to, but no, it's, it's Michael Jordan for me. And Brother Ronnie knows what I'm talking about over there. If somebody's going to preach with me, I know it's going to be him. But there's so many things that we could accomplish when we had those dreams as a little kid. We were going to be such great things. We all want to have good friends. How many followers you got on Instagram? How many Facebook friends you got? How many people do you have that you call friends on social media that you could call on and they would actually show up? Are they really your friends? Not trying to put down any of that stuff because it's a great tool. We can use it to evangelize. We can use it to get the word out. We can use it to get the message of Jesus Christ out there. But so many times we get wrapped up into how many people we have following us, how many people that we are following, how many people that we can say we have added as friends on there. But you know what? When it comes time to actually need somebody, how many of them are actually there? We all want those good friends, but... Have we ever thought about what it's going to take to become one ourselves? Are we one now? Can you honestly look in the mirror and say, you're a good friend to somebody. Somebody can count on you. Somebody, whenever they have a need, can call on you. And I know that you're going to be there. Have we messed up being that friend? Were we that friend once upon a time and through some bad decisions, maybe we fell out. Maybe we're no longer that person. What condition are we currently in? I know that we're in church tonight and we're supposed to be having Bible study and getting into the Word. And this might seem like a crazy subject to be bringing up to the congregation, you know, talking about friends. But Jesus was our friend, Brother Terrence. He was the friend that laid down his life for us. He said, there's no greater love than this that a man would lay down his life for his friends. You see, we are called to have that friendship. Two of the greatest commandments, love God and love your neighbor. That's called being a friend. It may seem silly to bring this to you tonight, but I would argue that the greatest way to promote unity and discipleship in the kingdom of God is to have those healthy friendships. To build those relationships with the people that we know and love. There are so many people that we have influence over in our lives that you wouldn't even think to respond to them, to reach out to them. You wouldn't even think that, that it would be important to you know, keep on building those relationships because they're always there. But some of the people that are the closest to us are the ones that need Jesus the most. And we're the one that can step in, that we can be that example, we can be that friend, we can show them the love of Jesus Christ. But do we ever think about it? Do we ever really think about being that friend to those people? We're called to spread the gospel. We're called to be the leaders in this faith that we live. We've got to put ourselves out there. We've got to win this world. And one of the major ways that I believe we can do that is just by being a good friend. Just like our opening text says, iron sharpens iron. Has anybody ever really thought about what that means, putting it into real perspective? Whenever you have two bars of metal, two bars of iron, and you rub them together and you scrape them together over and over and over, it's going to eat away at them little by little by little until you get a sharp edge on both of them. Because whenever you do that, it's going to take a little bit away from each one of them, and it's going to make something sharp out of each one of them. And that iron is going to sharpen iron. But when you think about it like that, are we the kind of people that can sharpen somebody else? We're called to rub off on people and guide them into a relationship with Jesus, but are we the kind of people that somebody would want to rub off on them? Or would we hurt somebody if we rubbed off on them? I want to stand here tonight and tell you that it could go either way because just because we're church people doesn't mean we're always good people. Just because we sit in a church pew doesn't mean that we're always friendly. Just because we come to this place every time the doors are open doesn't mean that when we're out in public that we are the face and figure of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we get it wrong, church. Sometimes we can, we can be rude in the drive, drive through can't we, Sister Meredith? <laughs> Not to bust her out, but she tells me that sometimes I'm a jerk to the people at McDonald's. 
And if I am, I'm sorry. <laughs> she tells me all the time, I can get just a little bit of pain of hunger, and I'm not myself anymore. <laughs> just because I stand behind this pulpit doesn't mean that I'm always what I'm supposed to be. I'm still human. I'm still working on it. I still have to learn how to be that friend. I still have to be friendly. The word says to show yourself friendly, but do we always obey the word? We do the best we can, but sometimes, Sister Maria, we mess up a little bit. Sometimes we get in the wrong place. We get in the wrong mindset, the wrong attitude. Something just makes us mad. We were walking out of the door tonight to come to this place, and there was something happened that upset my wife. It never fails. Something is going to happen. And we're not always the friendliest of people. But when you think of the kind of person that you are, would you be a good candidate to be somebody that sharpens another individual? Would you be somebody that if you were to rub off on them, would your character, would your attributes, would your traits make them a better person? Would the Jesus that you carry with you make them a better person? Or would the Jesus that they see in you turn them away? So we have the Holy Ghost. We carry the Lord with us. But when we're out in public, how do we act with him? Do we still talk about people? Are we still rude to people? When somebody needs us, is it a little too inconvenient? Are we friendly? Are we good at making friends? We're good at a lot of things. We're good at being nice to people. This is a great church. This church does a really good job of being nice to people. This church does a really good job of being friendly, does a really good job of showing Jesus to the world. This church, the people in this church are some of the best people in this world. But there's always a little bit that we can, that we can improve on. But I want to ask you today, can people trust us? Can people confide in us and trust that we're not going to talk about what they tell us? Are we there for people? If somebody has a need in their life, are we going to be the ones that show up to help them out? I can't talk to anybody else except for myself as well. I thought about bringing a little mirror up here and setting it on the pulpit. That way I could always see myself in it. Because this is one of those messages where the Lord gives it to me to examine myself first before I give it to somebody else. Brother Larry, you know what I'm talking about. This is one of those things that the Lord does to help keep us in check. This is not, this is not something where a person just gets up here and tells everybody else what to do, but you have to live it yourself as well. But as we get into the Word tonight, I want to examine three different stories. They all center around a common theme, but I don't want us to focus on the main character. There's a lot that goes on in the background in the Bible that we don't always read. But the people that were there and experienced it, they saw it. And even though it's not directly on those pages of your Bible, I believe it happened. And I'm not here to embellish the word. I'm not here to, to try to put something in it that it's not. But we've been given this book of stories. We've been given this book of scriptures to help us through everyday life. Jesus taught people face-to-face -face with the parables. He used everyday lessons like the fig tree or the, or the field, sowing the seed. He used everyday examples to be able to teach his disciples on how to live and how to get through this life. And I believe it's still no different today. It's just we have it in writing. We have it a little bit later down the road where we can look back and we can see how things played out. But as we get into these stories, I want to urge you to try to fit yourself into the narrative. Now, all three of these stories that I'm going to read to you tonight, all three of these things we're going to dive into, they all center around a paralyzed man, a man that can't walk. He can't do anything for himself as far as getting around. But I want to see how we line up. I want to see how that whenever we read this, how do we fit ourselves into it? How do we fit our church into it? How, how could we see ourselves improving in these situations? Well, the first place I want to go to tonight is John chapter 5. It says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. 
In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, half-withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now for a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. And Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked with and on the same day was the Sabbath. Now, I've preached a message solely on this passage of Scripture before. Brother Terrence, if you remember, it was titled, There's Something in the Water. And whenever we look at the story, we see a man. We don't really know how old he is. We just know that he's been in this condition for 38 years. There's been something wrong with him to where he, he can't walk anymore. He can't get around on his own. He has to rely on somebody to be able to bring him to this place. And he knows that if he can get to this pool, this miraculous place, that there is going to be something take place. An angel is going to come down. He's going to stir the water, going to stir it up. And he knows that if he can get into it, the first guy to get into it is going to be healed. But he's been laying there, and he's been laying there, and he's been laying there. We don't know how long he's been there. He could have been there every single day. He could have been there the whole 38 years trying to get into this water. But the thing about it is we, we don't see the background of this story, but somebody had to take him to that place. It's not like he could walk there. He couldn't drive there. He couldn't get on his chariot and go there. Somebody had to get him there. They had to prop him up on a horse. They had to prop him up on a donkey. They, they had to get him there somehow. He was not able to get there on his own, Brother Blake. Unless he lived at this pool, there's no other way he could have got there except by the help of somebody else. But when you think about this, for 38 years this man sat there waiting on the troubling of the waters. And there's no telling how many times that it happened. It could have happened day after day after day after day. And could you imagine the disappointment that this man had in his heart because somebody always beat him to the water. He laid there for all these years. He had this issue for all these years waiting on somebody to come help him in this water. And finally one day Jesus shows up and he says, will you be made whole? And he says, I can't. I have no man. There's nobody that can bring me into the pool. As soon as I, as, as I try to crawl across this ground, somebody comes and beats me into the water and they get their blessing before I can and then it's done. Nobody else after that first person at that time gets their blessing. But when I think about this, I think about the kind of people that may have had influence around him in his circle, the people that, that would have brought him there. What kind of friends were they? Sister Kelly, somebody had to bring this man there, but you know what? They, they could have stayed there and waited with him. They, they could have put a little extra effort into it, put a little bit of their time. But you know what? Sometimes whenever we say we're going to help somebody, once it gets a little too inconvenient for us, we just cut out. Brother Ronnie, sometimes whenever we say, you know what? If there's ever anything that I could do for you, you just let me know. But I'm praying and hoping that that day never comes. Somebody passes away. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for your loss. If there's anything I can do for you, just let me know. If I need to babysit the dogs, if I need to watch the kids, Lord, I know I said it, but please don't let them call on me. I, I'm just not ready for that commitment. I, I'm not really that kind of a friend. I'm the kind of person that says, you know what, I, I'm going to tell you that I'll help you out. But when the time comes, you know what, I, I'm probably just going to be a little too busy, Brother Jerry. But you think about this guy. Somebody over and over and over and over had to bring him to this place. I don't believe for one second that he lived by the pool for 38 years, Brother Blake. Eventually, somebody had to carry this man there. And whenever it got time for the angel to come down, there was nobody there to help him. They cut out on him. He had nobody there. They couldn't stick around and wait to help him. It wouldn't have took too much to throw this man up on their shoulder and go toss him in that water. I believe that somebody could have stayed with that guy and they could have helped him out. If they were a true friend, they would have done that. So how many of us have ever been that person whenever we say, you know, if there's anything I could do for you, I'm going to give you a ride, but I hope you don't need too much more than that. 
I, I hope that I'm not being too rude or being too plain tonight, but I just want to get into this word and see how that it's going to make me better, Brother Blake. It's going to make me a better person when I examine these stories and I see how that people had to deal with so-called friends in the word of God. And I believe that this is going to help me just get a little bit better. And I hope it helps somebody in here tonight. But how many times has it been just a little too inconvenient for us to actually step up and do what we said that we're going to do? This person probably carried this guy to the pool. No telling how many times. Probably hundreds. But his time was probably just a little too important that he couldn't stick around and help this guy out. Acts chapter 3. We find another paralyzed man. It says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, beginning the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. So once again, we find a man. This time, we don't know how old this guy is. It just says, from his birth, he was lame, which means he couldn't walk. He was paralyzed. So day after day after day after day, somebody had to carry this man to the temple gate. He couldn't go in because he had something wrong with him. It was against the law, but there was nothing that said that he couldn't lay there and beg for money from people. So this man, not being able to walk, not being able to get around on his own, somebody in his friend's group had to have been there to take him. But this time, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of friends would do that and just leave him? We, we don't have any account of anybody being there with him. But what would have to happen for somebody to keep doing it over and over and over and over and over and over, bringing him there every day? Most people would get burnt out after the first few times of going out there. They had to have been getting something out of it. Maybe they were getting some kickbacks of his begging money. Maybe they were getting some kickbacks, Brother Blake, of the, the guy that was sitting there. He was just their pawn. It was a little scheme that these group of people had going because they knew that whenever this, this beggar man was sitting at the church house that there was going to be some really good people walking by there that might have some pocket change that they would spare with this man because everybody knows church folks is generous. Everybody knows that church folks are good giving people, and they are. Everybody knows that these are the kind of people that if you have a need, they're going to give it to you. And he had a great thing going. But eventually, begging has to get old. But could you imagine being those people that were his friends that brought him there day after day after day? How, how much money do you think that they could have got out of him just by sitting him there? How many people have we taken advantage of? How many people have we been in that position to where we were trying to do a nice thing, but really we were trying to get some gain out of it. We were trying to get one over on somebody. There's, there's been many times where I feel like we have taken advantage, not as a church, not as, as a body, but you know, in our individual lives, how many times have we said, you know what, I, I was probably a little dishonest in how I've been working with this guy. I've probably probably done some things wrong. I, I shouldn't have used this guy to my advantage. I shouldn't have used this guy to get something out of the, the system. But I just have to think about the type of people that, that would have brought him there. It's very possible that the people that were taking him there were getting a cut of everything that he was bringing in. Or why else would they do it? How many people day after day after day would sacrifice their time would go out of their way to take a guy to the gate every day over and over knowing that they're not going to get anything out of it. How many people can honestly say that we would sacrifice that much time? How many people would say I'll do that for somebody? 
I think it's crazy how that we can, we can gain so much out of these stories in the Bible, all these accounts of these people. But there's so much that we can learn from it. We can apply this to our real life. Every one of us in here can think of somebody or even yourself. And I'm preaching to myself at the same time of that character bill took me. Now, these two cases that we've read through are people that I don't want to be like. I don't want to be like them. And I'm sorry for not giving you my title tonight, but it's to be a friend like them. I don't want to be a friend like those. I don't want to be a friend that was the, the carrying the guy to the pool. I don't want to be the friend, the so-called friend that was carrying the guy to the gate. But there are some people in the Bible that I do want to be like. And if we can get like them then we're going to be able to change this world. So if we go to Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, another paralyzed man, which was born of four. When they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed, wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there was a certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose took up his bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. We see, there was this man. He was a little bit different. He had some people in his life that actually cared for him, Sister Maria. They weren't trying to get one over on him. They weren't trying to, to let the inconvenience factor get to him. But there was these four men that had a buddy that couldn't walk. He was sick of the palsy. He couldn't get around on his own, but they didn't care. They still loved this man because he was their friend. And these four guys, they found out that this man named Jesus, this miracle worker, this new guy that came on the scene, he hasn't been around for this long yet ministering. And whenever they found out that he was in town, they saw the house that he was in. And whenever they got there, Brother Blake, they couldn't even get into the door. They couldn't peek into the windows. He was, he was so popular in this town that the house was full where he was at. They couldn't get no one else in. And these guys, they said, we're going to do anything that we can to get this man to Jesus because we know that he is a miracle worker. We know that if we can just get him to Jesus, that he's going to be healed. He's going to change his life. Brother Terrence, this man could be healed if they could just get him to the feet of Jesus. So you know what they did? They didn't say, nah, it's going to be too hard. They didn't say, nah, we, we carried you this far, but you're on your own now. You can just crawl on into the door. You can crawl through people's legs. You can get in there. No. He said, these four friends said, I care about you so much. We're going to do whatever we have to do to get you to Jesus. They so much wanted to get to Jesus that they crawled up on top of the house and they tore the roof off and lowered the man down at the feet of Jesus. If we could get that kind of mentality that we're going to be those kinds of friends, that we could get them to Jesus, how much of this world could we change if we were those kind of people? that said, I've got somebody that needs the Lord. I know somebody that needs a miracle in their life. I know somebody that needs a life change to go on, and I'm going to be the person that's going to help them get to Jesus. I'm going to be the person that lives the life right. I'm going to be the person that is the example. I'm going to be the person that will grab hold of them and talk some sense into them and let them know I know a Savior. I know a healer. I know a deliverer. I know somebody that can change your life. And if you will just come with me, if you will grab hold of my arm and go with me, I'm going to do everything that I can to get you to this man called Jesus, and he's going to change your life. If we could get that kind of mentality, we could become those kinds of friends that no matter the circumstance, that no matter what was standing in our way, no matter what was between them and Jesus, if we were going to do whatever we could to get them there, we're going to make it happen. That's the kind of people that we need to have in the church. That's the kind of people that I want to be. We can be like those other two guys. 
We can be like the friends that were at the well or at the pool. We can be like the friends that were at the gate. Or we can be like the people that carried their friend up on the roof. We can be those kinds of people. The choice is yours. You can be whoever you want to be. You're human. You can make that decision. You have the will to do as you desire. But I want to ask tonight if we could start getting on track to becoming people like this. All three stories center around a paralyzed man that I read to you tonight. They, these men, they all needed a miracle and they all had these so-called friends. But which ones do you want to be like tonight? Who do you want to be? Who do you want to have in your life? What kind of people do you want to surround yourself with? Are you the kind of person that you could sharpen another for good? Who do you want to be in this life? If you want to be a life changer, what do you have to change to get to that point? We can only change ourselves. But we can be an example to others. We can be leaders in others' lives. We can't change anybody. Only the Lord can change them. We can work on ourselves, but ultimately the Lord has to work through us. We have to work with God to make that change happen in our life. But who do you want to be tonight? Which ones have you been? Have you been those other two guys? Have you been the man that carried his friend up on the roof? Are you still that person? Who are you now? Brother Terrence, who are you? Who am I? When I look in the mirror, I have to ask myself that same question. Who are you today? Who do you want to be tomorrow? What kind of person do you want to be? Are you going to be the evangelist that you need to be? Are you going to be the person that's going to lead these people to salvation? Are you going to be the example in somebody's life? Are you going to be the person that says, ah, this is a little too inconvenient for me. I'm out this time. Uh, what's that? Right. But who are you right now? If we look at these stories from the human perspective, from the way that we think about things, it appears that two of these men only had an encounter with Jesus and the power of the Lord because of chance. Somebody just happened to be walking by them at the right time for them to receive their miracle. Jesus just happened to be traveling by at the right time for this guy to get his miracle. But there was one that had an encounter with God because he had some people in his life that loved him and they were going to do whatever they had to do to be sure that he made it to the feet of Jesus. We're going to change the world, church. But we have to do it the right way. We're going to change the world, even if it's one person at a time. We're going to change the world by building friendships. We're going to, be, we're going to change, the word, change the world by influencing people through the love of God that he has shown to us. So tonight, short message, but I want to leave you with a simple question. Out of those three stories, which friend are you? And if you don't like who you think you are, how are you going to change it? So tonight, as we leave this place, just think about that. We've got to make the world a better place. We have to be people of change. We have to be people that are going to be there. When we say, when we say, Sister Stephanie, if you need anything, you can call on me. It has to be for real. It has to be real. We have to evangelize. We have to go out. And we have to lead people to Jesus. And the best way that I believe that we can do that is building those relationships, building those friendships, and being genuine in those things. So which kind of friend do you want to be? That's, that's what I want to leave you with. In Jesus' name. Church is over. Ha, 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 ha.